we opened the new space with a show of Ted Stamm. He um, was an artist that came uh, to New York in the late 1960s, um, died in 1984 at the age of 39. And we presented the first sort of comprehensive show of his work um, really since the year after he died uh, in 84, 85. So this is an artist that I feel was really um, interesting. It's someone I learned about um, when I was in graduate school, you know, looking through old art magazines. Again, it's like a pre-internet. So I, you know, sit in school, library, like, look, look, look at, like, you know, art, art in America's or art forums from, like, the 80s or 70s. Like, wow, there's an interesting review of this guy named Ted Stamm. And Ted, um, you know, I always liked the work. It was always reproduced in black and white. I'm like, wow, this is interesting. And then, you know, a couple months later, I'm like, wow, there's that guy again. He's been reviewed again. And interesting, right? I might see him mentioned in a book somewhere, or see this, something in school, you know. Um, and I should say I was in school um, at Pratt doing two degrees, um, which seemed odd for most people. I was doing a graduate degree in painting and another one in art history. Um, one being, I guess, the way they had described it as being creative and the other one being academic. I didn't really see any difference between the two of them. Um, you know, as an artist, you are um, an historian of your own practice first and foremost. So in order to contribute anything to anything, you have to know what you're talking about, which means you have to know what went on before you and what other artists have done and how they thought about their work and, you know, where they were located in the kind of the big scheme of things. So, you know, I did both of those degrees. I did them at the same time. And, you know, I think, you know, I think of art history as kind of applied research, which is what we do here at the gallery. You know, this is like no difference. It's like, am I presenting work as an artist or am I presenting work as a historian or my curator or my dealer? I don't really see any difference between any of them at this point. Um, so, you know, Ted Stamm being a great example of both like applied research, art history, and painting. Like the things that I'm interested in as an artist, I'm interested in historical, like the context that they were made in. So, you know, I'd seen his work around um, when I was, you know, at the library, but, you know, he was nowhere to be seen. Not having any shows, not having any representation, you know, completely invisible. Didn't know anybody that knew him, you know. A few years later when we started the project, um, did a lot of studio visits, and I still do a ton of studio visits. Um, and I do about a studio visit a week at this point year round. So I've been to like hundreds and hundreds of studios over the last 10 years. Um, some artists many times, in fact, and I've been to studios all over the globe at this point, which is, you know, super fortunate. I mean, you don't, I mean, that's the, that's the best presentation of work, um, to see work in the studio, the artist is making it like kind of, and it's in, it's like its natural habitat, you know? Again, showing work in an exhibition, whether it's a group or a solo, or depending on the context of the venue, whether it's a nonprofit or for profit, all that brings sort of a different layer of meaning to the work. But seeing like where the work is like thought about and met, and sort of made and vetted and considered, seeing it in like the laboratory is like really a great privilege. So, um, you know, so I, when we started Mind Space, we started doing a lot of studio visits. Um, and, you know, we were doing visits with um, a lot of sort of older established artists, like in downtown Manhattan, you know, like Soho, Tribeca, East Village, you know, this kind of thing, Lower East Side. And, um, you know, inevitably I'd do a studio visit with someone and it would be terrific. And they'd walk me around their loft and they'd um, show me the work that they had like acquired during their lifetime or traded or collected or whatever, uh, or found on the street in some cases. Um, and inevitably there was a Ted Stamm in there somewhere. So, you know, it was really the first time I'd ever seen his work firsthand was through other artists, which was very generous and very cool. So, um, you know, I'd seen, you know, paintings, I'd seen work on paper, I'd seen experimental things. And, you know, I'd see this, you know, at this artist studio and they're like, wow, that's really great stuff. I gotta, you know, so great to see it. It's the first time I'd ever seen it. Then, you know, I'd be at someone else's studio like six or eight months later. I'm like, wow, there's another Ted Stamp piece. Totally different, earlier piece, maybe a monochrome, maybe a shaped rooster painting or something that's like black and impostoed or maybe a piece that, you know, was done by rolling dice or whatever, you know. Like, yeah, it's really great. And third studio and fourth studio, they'd sort of get a sense of like who this person were, was and, you know, like what the circle that he worked in, the kind of work he was making, and like where he was, and I'd hear kind of again oral history, which is exactly what you're doing about this person. Um, ultimately, to the point where I was able to kind of triangulate, you know, kind of GPS style, um, and figure out like who knew him well and where we could find 
you know, his work and who was watching out for it, who was caring for it, you know. And luckily there were, um, there was a couple of people that actually took his work on after he died. And he died um, at 39, which was the age that um, I was last year when I presented his work. And thinking through, like, what does it mean to present someone who's of my, my age, not my generation, clearly, but my age, and what does that mean to present their work? Kind of in a summative way. Um, and presented for the first time in 27 years, uh, you know, since he had died, 26 years, because they did a, you know, a survey show of his work in the university space on Long Island the year after he died. So what does it mean to present someone um, who was of great consequence and great meaning to other people um, who died before, you know, I knew I wanted to be an artist kind of thing. You know, he died when I was, what, 12? You know, um, and I never knew him, uh, never met him, but I know the people that knew him. So I feel like I know him kind of by proximity in a weird way. So we uh, opened the space with a show of his work that was about, you know, kind of looking at, you know, an artist, as artists, we make lots of different kind of work and we make lots of different kind of work over time. All the artists that we work with here do it. I would do it as well. So, you know, you're interested in like lots of things. And as artists, you only ever have the opportunity to present um, certain aspects of your work, maybe one aspect of your work if you're lucky, or maybe a couple of aspects. So you may be making different kinds of um, paintings or sculpture or performance or drawings, but you know you may only ever have the opportunity to show like one kind of painting or one kind of drawing or one kind of you know performance work, um, where in fact your practice is like much, much bigger. You're only ever able to show a percentage of that or a fraction of it. So we wanted to uh, show in this show, again, with limited space, various aspects of his work. Um, so we showed, uh, you know, a Dodger painting, a Wooster painting, some works on paper and some other stuff as well. Um, so like one of each, again, this kind of Noah's Ark, one of this kind, one of that kind, one of the other, to at least give people a survey. And I feel like his work is very um, anticipatory, pre prescient of work that went on during the 1980s that was kind of um, deconstructed, kind of proto-punk, kind of, you know, black painting. It's certainly anticipated, in my opinion, people like um, Stephen Perino or Banks Violet and others. Again, whether they knew of his work or not, probably not, because he hadn't been seen. I mean, he's been invisible, but he certainly was in a position to, had he had survived, you know, um, to have influenced a lot more people. So I had people of all generations that came into that show that either knew him and were like, wow, I remember when he made this work and they were sharing stories, or wow, it's too bad that he died so early. Or, you know, which was much more interesting to me, younger generations of artists that had never heard the name, never seen the work, who were absolutely like dumbfounded by it, like awestruck um, by work uh, that he had made during the late 1970s and 80s that was so interesting uh, and so compelling and so relevant to what people are thinking about now in terms of like content in the work, referencing things, methods of making the work, shape of the work, you know, I, kind of everything, the scale of the work. Um, he really anticipated a lot of stuff that was going on, you know, certainly in the 1990s, but definitely in the 2000s, at the first decade of the century, uh, but just died too early. So these are the kind of shows that I think that we do best here. Uh